So, I, like Will mentioned, am very interested in the notion of how much tradition hinders or facilitates creativity. And I want to draw a few parallels from my own life, which is art, being an artist, uh, traditional music, and then the last kind of uh, part will be about wine and traditional winemaking versus a more kind of global technical style of winemaking. So I was born in Santa Fe, New Mexico into a family of artists. And New Mexico is a beautiful place. The landscape was beautiful. My father was a stone carver, my mother a watercolorist. And from a very early age, the idea of what is aesthetics, what is beauty, how to seek beauty, how to live beautifully, and most importantly for an artist, how to make beauty, became a very important question in my life. By the time I was about 15 years old, I was already um, in my search, but really hadn't gotten a grasp on what direction it was going to take. And by this time, my family had moved back to the East Coast, and I was in Richmond, Virginia, skateboarding down the street to my favorite alternative music shop, which was called Plan 9. And I went in for the kind of skateboarding music section, but as I passed, there was a very small world music section, which back then was quite rare to have at a music shop. And a CD caught my attention out of the corner of my eye called Georgian Folk Music Today. And I thought, well, that doesn't look like Atlanta. I mean, there was Georgian writing, and it was very Eastern looking. So I bought the CD, skated back home, and popped it in my stereo and was floored. There was something about the uh, resonating polyphony. There was something about uh, the harmony, and it spoke to me on a deeper level than any type of music I'd ever heard before. So I decided I needed to find out more about this ancient country. Meanwhile, though, I needed to get an art education. So I uh, set out to go to school at the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore. And about three years deep into the education, I was feeling that I wanted something a little more traditional. I was very interested in older forms of art and realism. And doing research, I was looking for where is that old school that will give me uh, what I want to sink my teeth into, and ended up in Moscow. Uh, while I was in Moscow, I uh, painted all summer long and was managed to get accepted to the Surikov Academy. And I met uh, my teacher, uh, Vyacheslav Zabelin, and something about the way he taught reminded me of my first experience with that Georgian music. When he talked about how to see color, how to feel space, uh, how to merge content with form, he was never speaking on his own authority, but on the authority of a tradition that transcended his own personal ego. He talked about how, John, wherever the eye is small and humble, then there's room for something much greater than the eye to uh, be, uh, appear in the work. And he always talked about his teacher and his teacher's teacher and his teacher's teacher. And somehow I realized that they looked at themselves not as independent artistic creators in and of themselves, but as bearers of a torch or as uh, artists that could channel an ancient craft through themselves. It was very different than the experience and approach in America. During that time, I came to Georgia in 1995, and the experience was, these are some of my paintings from the early period, the town I live in. But when I first came to Georgia in 1995, still a student in Moscow, a unbelievable experience happened. I was taken, like probably most of you, the first time you come to Georgia, straight to a restaurant from the airport or to a big super at someone's home. And being a vegetarian art student in Moscow in the mid-90s from America, you know, there were some culinary disappointments. And when I showed up at Georgia at this incredible banquet, I was blown away by the variety of vegetables and cheeses and food and wine that was good and it was pouring and it never stopped and elegant Toastmasters. And I was about 10 horns deep into my feast when the Toastmaster summoned the musicians. And lo and behold, the musicians that walked in, I recognized. And I had studied a little bit of Georgian while I was in Moscow. And I told them in Georgian, I called them by their names. And they turned out to be the very same musicians that had been on the CD that I bought when I was 15 years old. And so I realized that my relationship with Georgia was not going to be a simple one. I bought a home in 1996, was still doing graduate work in 98, and spent all of my free time painting and collecting folk music in Georgia. 
And again, there was something in the polyphonic tradition that I came to understand that had the same notion that my Russian art teacher had. It was that a Georgian traditional polyphonic song can't be sung by one person. It's a dialogue through harmony. And at the, on the one hand, there's 26 different ethnic uh, regions of singing traditions in Georgia, and each one has their own style and their own rules and what is authentic and what isn't authentic. And yet within it, part of the authenticity is extraordinary improvisation. There's an amazing dialogue that is an exchange between the singers. In Kahetian folk music, for instance, you never do ornamentation paralleling one another, the top two voices. It's always this chase, like two birds you know, flying through the sky, playing with one another. And this idea of structure and formality being a platform or a springboard for intense creativity, creativity that, in my opinion, was often deeper than when someone just had a guitar in their hands and they could play anything that they wanted. I had found the same experience to be true when I traveled through Spain. That in flamenco, for instance, great flamenco is a dialogue between the guitarist, the singer, and the dancer. And why there's extremely rigid traditions of how a buleria, so a faruca, should be performed, the, each and any member of that trio could command the rest to conform and change pace based on absolute improvisation. So again, I was uh, growing more and more deep in my conviction that tradition can actually be a wonderful way to foster creativity rather than hinder it. And so this idea of freedom and structure and traveling through the mountains and valleys of Georgia, collecting folk songs, same's true of dance. It's even true of the chanting tradition. And then a new chapter in my life began. Uh, it was a serendipitous day. I was standing in mid-August, underneath a hot Cahetian sun, in the afternoon, making this painting. And as I was making this painting, trying not to pay attention to the mosquitoes, the sweat dripping off of me, all the dust I was breathing by the cars that were driving by, and then, on top of all of that, a young man drove up with an old tractor about 50 meters from where I was standing and wasn't moving. He kept the tractor going and said, I'm trying to focus on art and space and color and there's this behind me. And I'm wondering, you know, couldn't he just like get on with himself? You know, why is he here? And I see that he's trying to call out to me. And I call back to him that I can't hear you. Could you turn off your motor? And he says, well, I don't have a starter and I'm in a flat place. So no, I can't turn off my motor, but I really want you to come to my home for dinner tonight. My name is Gela Patalashvili, and I have some business to talk to you about. So I was kind of startled at why this stranger invited me to his home for dinner, and, uh, but happy that he left with his tractor so I could get back to my painting. And I went to visit uh, Gela that night, and I found a young Georgian that was, uh, you know, there's a sequence and a tradition to the toast, as many of you know, around a Georgian feast. And almost all of his toasts were about nature, understanding nature, listening to the vines, the ancient tradition of winemaking. And at a certain point, again about 10, I think we were drinking out of bowls then, 10 drinking bowls deep into the feast, he says, with tears in his eyes, he said, why are you only focusing on Georgian folk music and chants and dance? Why are you neglecting the very pulse of our nation, the very heart is wine. And he says, we have an 8,000 year old winemaking tradition, 525 Otacon varietals, and yet basically it's almost been uh, only in the periphery and in small villages is the ancient practice of making traditional Georgian wine still kept alive. And that more and more of the wine that is going to export markets uh, doesn't have, a, isn't carrying a Georgian passport, it doesn't have necessarily Georgian character. And he said that himself, his grandfather, his great-grandfather, everyone had been making wine, and that he didn't want to be the link in the golden chain that has spanned from 8,000 vintages in Georgia, despite war, despite famine, despite all the trials in history, he didn't want to be a member of the generation that let that link break, and would I help him? Basically, he said, do you have conscience? And um, I'm an artist, and I don't have a deep bank account or deep pockets. And so I said, well, what do you, what do you need from me? And he said, well, help me buy this vineyard. It's a perfect place, a perfect terroir location. So we bought the vineyard. And then we realized we needed to build a place to actually make the wine. And it wasn't until we actually had the wine and realized we needed to sell it somehow that I started doing 
a lot of research of what might be the market. And the philosophy of the company was we would have only Georgian varietals, we would use only traditional methods, and we loved nature, so we were going to take care of everything and do it all organically. But the more and more I started to read, I realized there were two wine worlds out there. There was a wine world that was celebrating that New World wine regions had released traditional winemaking from its chains, that all of a sudden, uh, you know, the, the different varietals that were used in Europe and Spain and France and Italy, that each village had their own traditions and their own methods, and some of the wines are a little bit funky and very nonconformist. All of a sudden, more and more of these regions were trying to garner Parker points and lucrative markets, and the, the influence of this New World taste of big, jammy, oaky, high-alcohol wines on the contrary, it was not facilitating creativity, it was actually homogenizing the world of wine. So you could go to Napa Valley, Barossa, or you could go to uh, France, or even Tel Aviv, and taste a wine that was more or less made with the same aromatic yeast, with the same enzymes, and the same stainless steel, using reverse osmosis, and so forth. And there was then a counter wave to this of a young group of many of the millennium generation winemakers and wine connoisseurs that decided they wanted to bring character back to wine. They wanted to celebrate the diversity, and in order to do that, they were going back to the roots and the traditions of different winemaking techniques. And so, again, bringing this back to my idea of a search for beauty in life, I realized that diversity was an integral part of aesthetic pleasure, an integral part of living a beautiful life, and I ended up being part of what some people are calling a wine revolution of bringing back character, bringing back um, face, to bringing back a celebration of diversity, of texture, weight, uh, flavor, uh, in wine. And strangely enough, you know, here we have a monastery from the 11th century, or it's a 6th century monastery that has a winery that's been from the 11th century that was recently reestablished at Ala Verde. And traveling with the Bishop of Ala Verde, we ended up in some of the hippest bars in New York City, San Francisco, and Los Angeles, meeting wine buyers that were already selling our wine to a public of people that had, um, let's say, very counterculture public that loved these wines. And this is a story of how ancient wine, a winemaking tradition that's 8,000 years old, actually um, inadvertently has become cutting edge. Some would even say avant-garde. These are the wines that break all the rules. And these are the wines that are um, together with parallel uh, efforts being made in countries all over the world to bring back uh, greater transparency to wine so that it's pure, so it has more rooted not only to tradition, but rooted to the stones, earth, wind, sun, from where the wines came from. So the summary of my, my life of searching for beauty, I can say is that, first of all, it's easier to preserve a tradition than it is to reestablish it. So before you lose it and the next generation decides that there was something that had a lot of value and quality to it, it's uh, very difficult to establish and in some cases impossible to establish. There's something about the passing on of a tradition from master to disciple that matters. And I've seen uh, a living art school that stems the millennium and there's a generational uh, passing on of the torch, and I've seen societies of people that go to museums and look at textbooks and they try to paint like the old masters. The two are very different. I've also tasted wines from people that read books about the old ways of doing it, and I've tasted wines that have learned uh, by winemakers that have learned from their grandfathers how to farm, and there's a huge difference. So uh, living in Georgia is a celebration for me, um, but I wish Georgia and I wish all of us to kind of do what we can in order to make sure that we properly value what it is we think it's time to let go of. And uh, that actually tradition can facilitate an evolution of aesthetics and beauty, and certainly it can be an incredibly positive force in creativity. Thank you.